yeah. I think we might have some church. Go ahead and have a seat, man. Woo, I don't know what God's doing at Paul Land, but I like it. Just keep it up, man. It's good to be here today. Man, great to have you guys here today. Hey, before I jump into this sermon, how about we give the Lord a little hand clap of praise for the rain that we got, man. Wow. I know there's been some people praying for rain, and God answered our prayers, man, and sent it to us. So praise the Lord for that. Well, if you got your Bible, open up to Genesis chapter 40. Genesis chapter 40. We're in a series on Joseph, Old Testament Joseph. And uh, this guy, Joseph, man, he's a champion, all right? He is somebody that the Bible puts forth as an example for us to emulate, to follow, to be like. He's a man of character, integrity. He's a key leader. And uh, he was a great man of faith. He's included in uh, Hebrews chapter 11 as a man of faith. In Genesis chapter 39, the Bible referred to him as a successful man. But he is a success not necessarily because he didn't have any difficulties in his life. In fact, most of the time in Scripture, faith is, is defined not by our success, but how we overcome our setbacks. And Joseph, as we're going to see, is the king of the setback. He did not go from A to B. He was kind of like most of us. He would take, you know, one step forward and two steps back. He had a lot of difficulties in his life, but in spite of his difficulties, he was a man of faith. Faith is defined by how we respond to difficulties, setbacks, trials in our life more than it is our success. So even if you think about Hebrews chapter 11, the different people that are listed in there that God said these are great men and women of faith, almost all of them were in there because of setbacks that they overcame. So think about Abel, one of the very first ones, a list that he had a little setback in that his brother Cain killed him, right? Abraham uh, was a man of faith. He followed God all the way to the promised land. As soon as he got to the promised land, there was a famine in the land and he had to leave. You think about Moses. Moses was a guy that killed somebody, and it cost him 40 years of his life. Sarah was a woman that was promised to have descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, but she couldn't have any children. Rahab was a prostitute. Samson let Delilah cut his hair. I mean, these people, it wasn't by their success that they were defined. It was rather by their setbacks and how they overcome them and most of all the time our faith is defined by how we overcome our setbacks and the reason I bring this up is because Joseph he experienced three setbacks in a row I'm going to look at the third one today in Genesis uh, chapter 40 but 2020 for many people has just been the year of the setback and we recognize that COVID-19 hit and it was kind of an equal opportunity destroyer and it didn't really matter who you were or where you lived or what you did. It had a negative impact on your life. But we recognize the fact that there are people listening to us today on Facebook, some of you here in this service, that uh, 2020 has been a year of the setback for more difficult reasons even than that. And so if you're here today and you're in the midst of a setback or if you experienced one, you're in the midst of a difficulty, I just hope that the story of Joseph might encourage you today just to hang on to Jesus for a little bit longer, all right? So this is a story, Genesis chapter 40, uh, verse 1. After this, the king of Egypt's cupbearer and baker offended their master, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and, and, and put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guards in the prison where Joseph was confined. And the captain of the guard assigned Joseph to them as their personal attendant, and they were in custody for some time. Now, if you were here a couple of weeks ago, I talked about that when you study the Bible, you want to observe what the text says to you. So you want to just look for things like key repeated words or key repeated phrases. In this passage today, a key repeated word is going to be the word dream. You also want to look for any reference to God, Holy Spirit, Jesus, the author. You want to mark those things and see what you can learn about them. You also want to mark any time you see a reference to time because time helps us understand context. If you notice here in chapter 4, 40, verse 4, that it ends with they were in custody for some time. Chapter 41, verse 1 begins like this at the end of two years. So chapter 41 is something that takes place two years after chapter 40, and we know exactly when that was because chapter 41, verse 46 tells us that when 41 takes place, Joseph was 30 years old. So the events of chapter 40 take place two years earlier than that, so Joseph was 28 years old. I don't know how many 28-year-olds we have in the room today, 
Joseph was 28. We also know from Genesis chapter 37 that when he began this journey to Egypt, he was 17 years old. That means he's been in Egypt for 11 years, most of them in prison. I'm just going to say that's a setback. He's been in Egypt for 11 years of his life, and the most of them he was in prison. Now, if we look back to how he got there, you know, he got there. Joseph was uh, born to Jacob, as in Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He was 11th son born to Jacob. He wanted to have 12. Benjamin was a younger brother. He had 10 older brothers. And uh, Joseph, when he was a young man, 17, he brought a report to his father that the Bible describes as a bad report. Literally, the word in Hebrew is evil. In other words, the other 10 brothers were doing some things they shouldn't have been doing. And Joseph, being righteous, told his dad about them, which might have been the right thing to do. But his brothers didn't like it, right? They were mad at him about it. And then on top of that, Joseph was Jacob's favorite son. And Jacob unfairly showed him favoritism in a number of different ways, primarily by giving him this coat of many colors. And most people believe this coat of many colors was probably a long sleeve tunic, went down to the ankles, that, that by giving him that coat, what he was saying was, Joseph, I recognize you as my eldest son, the one that's going to get the birthright. Now, it's hard to think he was the eldest son when he was 17, but he had been born to Rachel, who was Jacob's most beloved wife, firstborn son to Rachel. And so by giving him the birthright, this coat, basically what he was saying is, when I die, you're going to get a double portion of the inheritance, and you're going to become the ruler of the family. So Jacob says to Joseph, you're going to be the birthright, you're going to become the ruler of the family, and it says his brothers hated him because of it. You can see why. And then on top of that, Joseph has some dreams. It's recorded for us in chapter 37 that he had two particular dreams. One of them in verse 6, he says this. He said to them, to his older brothers, listen to the dream that I had. There we were binding sheaves of grain in the field and suddenly my sheaf stood up and your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. Isn't that an awesome dream? And his brother said to him, really, you're really going to reign over us. You're going to rule over us, dude. We hate you. And then he goes on to say he had another dream. Look, he said in verse 9, I had, a, I had another dream. And this time the sun, moon, and 11 stars were bowing down to me. And they really, mom and dad are going to bow to you now. We hate you. Now let me just say a word about these two dreams. These, these were not dreams like you might have like when you eat too much Mexican food and go to sleep real late, Right? Like you get up the next day and go, dude, I had this dream last night. It was awesome. I just can't remember it. And the part I can't remember, I don't even know what it meant. This, is, this was a dream that was a divinely inspired dream. It was a revelation from God to Joseph. It spoke about his future and his destiny and his being a ruler sometime in his future. And, 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 he, and Joseph recognized it as such. This was just not a normal dream. This was God speaking to me revealing to me what's going to happen in my future. And Joseph took it as such, but the brothers hated him because of it. And so they hatched up a plan to, to kill him. It says in verse 12 they or 19, they plotted to kill him. And they said to one another, oh, look, here comes the dream expert. They hated this dream. Verse 20, so now, come on, let's kill him and throw him to one of the pits. And we can say that a vicious animal ate him. And then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. They didn't, they didn't like the thought of him ruling over them. They didn't like the dream, and so they decided to get rid of the dreamer, and they decided to kill him. They kidnapped him. They beat him up. They ripped off his cloak. They threw him in a pit with the intent to kill him, but Reuben, the eldest, talked him out of it, and instead they sold him to a group of Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And the Ishmaelites take him to Egypt where he's sold into slavery to a guy named Potiphar who's the captain of the guard. And uh, it says in 39 too that the Lord was with Joseph. Everything the guy touched turned to gold. He was very prosperous. He was a great leader. Everything he did was just well. Uh, Potiphar saw that, put him in charge of everything, and God started blessing Potiphar's house because of Joseph. And after time, Potiphar's wife also noticed Joseph who was handsome and good looking it says in scripture and well built and she's like would you lie with me and Joseph refused it okay and because of that he she accused him falsely accused him of rape he's arrested and thrown into prison talk about a setback 
number two in a row. He's sold by his brothers. Your family might be dysfunctional. Hopefully not that bad. And then number two, he is falsely accused and thrown into prison. Set back number two. Well, while where he was there for a while. Okay. It says us in chapter 40, then in verse 5, the king and Egypt's cupbearer and baker, these are the two new guests. So he's in prison, he's serving in prison, and he gets two new guests, uh, the chiefs, the pharaohs, cupbearer and baker. Now, uh, if you were a cupbearer, you were the guy that drank the wine or the water or the apple juice before the king did to make sure it wasn't poison. It's like, you drink it, if you die, I'm not drinking it. If you drink it and you're fine, I'll drink it. And the cupbearer, that's what his responsibility was. The baker's responsibility was to eat the food before the king ate it to make sure it wasn't poisoned, okay? Subsequently, these guys were high-ranking officials. They were prosperous. They were in the know. They were with the king all the time. Every time before he drank something, this guy drank it. He was a, like a consultant to the king. Nehemiah, in chapter 1, verse 11, Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king. He had tremendous influence. He was very wealthy. This is the cupbearer and the king, two very high-ranking officials in the Egyptian government. They get thrown in jail. We don't know why they got thrown in jail. Maybe Pharaoh got some food poisoning and thought these guys were out to get him. All right? We don't know. Like one time I went on a mission trip, and on the way over there, we had a layover, and I got food poisoning. I don't know if it was something I ate something I drank, but man, I got sick, and by the time I got to where I was going, it was really early in the morning, early morning flight, I got off the flight, off the plane, I remember going up this two flights of steps to where we were staying, and by the time I got up there, I'm in this cold sweat, I take a couple of Cipro's, I tell the guy, I need to lay down for a minute, I did this face plant on his bed, and the next thing I know, this guy comes in, he wakes me up, he says, hey, we're going to go get something to eat, you want to go, and I said to him, dude, is it breakfast time yet, he says, it's 6 o'clock in the evening, dude. You've been sleeping for 12 hours. I got up. I'm like thinking, if I knew where I got the food poisoning, I would put that guy in prison, right? If you've ever had food poisoning, man, you're going to do something. You're mad about something. And so maybe they, maybe he got food poisoning. They, they wind up in prison. It says in verse 5, the king of Egyptian's cupbearer and baker who were confined in prison each had a dream, both had a dream on the same night, and each dream had its own meaning. They get put in prison, and that night they both have a dream, and each mean, each dream had a, its own meaning. Now, every time in the Joseph narrative, just a side note, every time you see dreams, there's always two of them. Joseph had two dreams. Here's two different guys. They each have a dream on the same night. In chapter 41, you'll see Pharaoh has two dreams back to back. And Joseph tells us in chapter 41, verse 32, 32, since your dream was given twice to Pharaoh, it means that the matter has been determined by God and he will carry it out soon. Two dreams. The baker has a dream and the cupbearer has a dream. Verse 6, when Joseph came into them in the morning, he saw that they looked distraught. So he asked the Pharaoh's officers who were in custody with him in his master's house, why do you look so sad today? Because he cared about them. And he said in verse 8, we had dreams, they said to him, but there is no one to interpret them. These guys look sad. What's going on with you guys? You don't look so good today. He said, well, we, we had a dream last night, but the problem is I can't have anybody to interpret them. They weren't so freaked out about having had the dream. It was the fact that nobody could interpret the dream. In the time of Egypt, at this time when this was written, Dreams were a really big deal to people, man. They saw them as God showing them the future somehow. And so they were professional dream interpreters. And they had these books and they had these ways and you'd tell them their dream and they'd tell you what it meant. Pharaoh in chapter 41 calls them wise men and magicians. It's where we get the term wise men, three wise men from Babylon because they had the same thing going on in Babylon in those days. They said, hey, dude, the problem is we had this dream, but nobody can interpret it for us. And Joseph responds in 40, verse 8, that Joseph said to them, Don't interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. Joseph responds, Don't interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. Like, hey, these dream interpreters that you got, dude, they're in the dark. Only God knows. Only God knows about the dreams. God gives dreams. God gives the interpretations. And I got good news for you. I know God. 
Now, sometimes in Scripture, when you're reading it, you come across a passage of Scripture, and uh, you'll just read right by it. Like, you don't think it's significant. You just read it and, and just read right by it. When in reality, that particular passage of Scripture is the key to the whole passage. This is chapter 40, verse 8. Joseph says to this guy, these two, these two men, hey, don't interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dream. Now, by saying that statement, basically what, what Joseph is saying is, I still believe in my dream. I still believe in my dream. I had a dream. I still believe it. I still believe God's going to bring it true in my life. Because you think about it, if Joseph had had this dream and he, and, and he had these setbacks, he'd been sold into slavery by his brothers, he'd been falsely accused, he'd been in prison for 11 years, and, and, and somebody comes up to you and, and they says, hey, I've had a dream, and if you didn't believe your dream, you know what you'd say to him? So what? So what? You had a dream. I had a dream once. It didn't come true. So what? You had a dream. Too much Mexican food. I had a dream once it didn't come true. Don't believe in your dreams, but that's not what Joseph says. Joseph says, man, do not interpretations belong to God. Hey, tell me your dream. I can interpret it for you because I know God. It's a turning, it's a turning point in the, not just the passage, but the story. Don't interpretations belong to God. Tell me your dream, he says, verse 9. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph. Watch for the threes in this passage. In my dream, there was a vine in front of me. On the vine were three branches. As soon as it budded, its blossoms came out, and its clusters ripened into grapes. Apparently, it's a fast-forward dream. Verse 11, Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes, squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Joseph, man. Dude, don't have to think about it. He don't have to pray about it. It's like God just revealed to him what this dream meant, verse 12. This is the interpretation Joseph said to him. The three branches are three days. In just three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head. That, that's a phrase that means he's going to hear your case. In three days, he's going to hear your case. He's going to lift up your head and, here's the favorable part, restore you to your position. You will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand the way you used to when you were his cupbearer. Oh, it's good news, dude. In three days, you're going to be restored to everything the way it was before verse 14. But when all goes well for you, Joseph is sure this is going to happen. Hey, remember, remember that I was with you. Please show kindness to me by mentioning me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. For I was kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews. And even here, I have done nothing that they should put me in the dungeon. Hey, when, when you get out, because you're getting ready to get out, just remember me and mention me to Pharaoh because I haven't done anything to deserve being in this prison. Will you just remember me? Verse 16, when the chief baker saw that the interpretation was positive, he said to Joseph, dude, I also had a dream. Three baskets of white bread were on my head. In the top basket were all sorts of baked goods for Pharaohs, but the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. Verse 4, 18, Joseph just, this is, this, is, this is his interpretation. Hey, just think about this for a minute. If somebody came to you and they said, Kurt, dude, I had a dream last night. I'd be like, what was it? Dude, I had this basket on top of my head that was full of bread and birds were eating it. What do you think that means? No. hungry I mean how, how, what do you say to that like well don't eat white bread it'll make you fat I don't know man like I mean what do you do I mean not Joseph man this is its interpretation Joseph replied the three baskets are three days in just three days Pharaoh's going to lift up your head he's going to hear your case but in your case he's going to lift your head from off you and hang you on a tree, then the birds will eat the flesh from your body. One dream represented life. The other dream represented death. Verse 20, on the third day, on the same day, Jesus was resurrected from the dead. 
on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he gave a feast for all his servants. He elevated the chief cupbearers and the chief baker among his servants. Pharaoh restored the chief cupbearer to his position as cupbearer, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But Pharaoh hanged the chief baker just as Joseph had explained to them. Here comes a setback. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. Chapter 41, verse 1, at the end of two years. Now, I've heard the story of Joseph a number of times in my life, beginning when I was a little kid. I've thought about this story a number of times. I've heard it preached before. And there's always one thing about this story of Joseph that always sticks out to me that I never could figure out. And what it was was it was this two years. I'm like, what's up with the two extra years? Like, by the time you get to 41, Joseph is going to be released from prison in one day. He's going to get out of prison. It's going to happen in one day. And the reason he's going to get out of prison is because of his request to the cupbearer and asking him to remember his dream interpretation. That's going to be the reason he gets out of prison. It's going to happen in one day. I'm thinking if God could do it in one day, why has Joseph got to wait two more years? To me, this is the worst setback of the three I mean it's one thing to get you know sold into slavery by your family and it's another thing to be falsely accused and thrown into prison but when you're so close man to getting out and then two more years in prison man it's just rough I I think what God wants us to see that the question is not necessarily the setback but how does Joseph respond How does Joseph respond to the setback, right? How does he respond to that? And and what I want to just say is, in spite of all his setbacks, Joseph still believed in a dream. He still believed that God was going to fulfill what God had promised he was going to do. He still believed it. And somehow in believing in the promise, man, that sustained him through the setback in spite of all the setbacks he had experienced he still believed that God was going to do what God was going to do now people ask me all the time and maybe this goes through your mind it's like Kurt does God still speak through dreams because sometimes I have some crazy dreams I'm wondering God trying to say something to me through my dreams and I'll say to you man look God spoke to to Joseph in dreams, he spoke to Pharaoh in dreams, he spoke to the cupbearer in dreams, he spoke to Abraham, he spoke to Joseph, he spoke to Paul. I mean, God can speak through a dream. God can speak any way he wants, right? If God wants to speak through a dream, God can speak through a dream. The amazing thing to me is not that God can speak through dreams. The amazing thing to me is that God speaks. God speaks. God still speaks, right? Right? God still speaks. God still uses people. God still keeps his promise. God speaks to his people. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2 says this. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at various times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. In these last days, he has spoken to us through his son, you know. God communicated to us in a way that we could understand by sending his own son, Jesus, to take on human flesh. So if you want to know what God's like, you could look at Jesus. What did he say? What did he teach? How did he act? If you want to know how much God loves you, you look to Jesus and what he did on the cross. If you want to know how we should, what our commandments are, we look to Jesus and what he said. And praise God, somebody took the time to write them down. Somebody had enough energy and effort and forethought to be like, dude, I should write down this stuff about Jesus because this, and guess what? We got it right here. This is God's word speaking to you. Hebrews chapter 14 verse 12 puts this way, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit's joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intents of our heart that God's word is active. It's not just a bunch of old words on a page. This is God's word written so that you can read it and God can speak to you through it. God speaks to you, and what does he speak? What does he say to us through his word? What does he give us? He gives us promises. Promises. You're a believer in Jesus. Man, you've got promises. 
Promises that Jesus will be with you. Promises that Jesus will provide for you. That he cares for you. That he loves for you. That he wants to give you life. That he wants to give you abundant life. That he wants to give you greater life. That he wants to give you eternal life. These are the promises of God. If you just believe them. When you suffer a setback, the question is, do you believe the promises or not? In the midst of his setback, Joseph still believed in the promises that God was going to do what God says he was going to do. So here you have God speaks, God still speaks, and God still uses people. If you're a believer in Jesus, God wants to use you. He has a plan for you, a destiny for you. He's got something for you to accomplish in your life. He just has to prepare you to do it. How does God prepare you to do what he's called you to do? Through setbacks. Because setbacks are how God actually fulfills the dreams that he's given you. It's through the setback that God fulfills the dream that he's given to you. So think about Genesis chapter 37. You've got these brothers that are so angry at Joseph, they decide they're going to kill him so that the dream will not come true. And so they get together and they throw him in a pit and they sell him into slavery to get rid of the problem. Oh, he's gone now. He, the, dream, the dream expert is gone now. Where do they sell him to? Where does he wind up in Egypt? Where did he have to go to fulfill his dream? Egypt. What they tried to do to get rid of him actually was a setback that helped him fulfill his dream. And then once he gets to Egypt, he gets falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, and he gets sent to prison. What a setback. What does he do in prison? Who's he meet in prison? The chief cupbearer. Who's the chief cupbearer? The dude that's going to put him in front of Pharaoh. It was the setback that put him in place to fulfill his dream. We had a girl in second service that I get baptized. She gave the most incredible sermon. She got saved. You know why? Because of a setback. It's a setback that set us up for our dreams. Setbacks become step-ups to what God wants to accomplish. You think about uh, Jesus. You think about Satan coming along, and Satan's plan is to get rid of the seed of woman because he's going to crush his head. So he's got a plan. He stirs up evil men to put Jesus on the cross because he's going to kill him. Because if I can kill him, then I win. They put Jesus on the cross and crucify him, and Satan thinks he's won. But in reality, on the cross... Jesus pays for the penalty of sin and death and is resurrected on the third day and does the exact opposite than what Satan thinks. Satan thinks he's won, but in reality, he gets his power crushed all in one day. It was through the setback. You talk about the king of the setback. Jesus is the king of the setback. He is falsely betrayed, falsely accused, crucified, but it's through his crucifixion that he fulfills his destiny and provides for you a completely new destiny. This is just how God works. It's through the setback that he accomplishes the impossible to help you fulfill your dream. Therefore, your setback is not a setback. It's actually a step up because this is the way God, how do you respond to a setback? You believe in the promises of God. Man, you believe they're going to come true for you or not? Joseph, I mean, Jesus, man, Isaiah 53, you'll, after your suffering, you'll see the light of life. I just believe Jesus believed it. He was willing to go to the cross and what God fulfilled it even in him. In Joseph's story, you have two dreams. One dream that went, resulted in life, another dream that resulted in death. Pharaoh has two dreams, one that results in life, one that results in death. Every time there's a destiny of death, God provides a way of escape for that, even all the way back to Noah. This is what God did for us through Jesus. He provides a way of escape. So what God does for us is he presents us with two destinies. Everybody in the room is presented with two destinies. You have a destiny of life through faith in Jesus Christ, abundant life, eternal life. Or you have a destiny of death if you just continue in your unbelief. But because of what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross, he now has the ability God does to present you with a choice. By grace through faith, you can choose which destiny you choose. By believing in the promises of Jesus, you can choose life, abundant life, eternal life, the promises of God. If you don't believe in the promises of Jesus, you have a destiny of death. It all hinges on what you do with the promises of Jesus. Are you willing to believe it or not? Can you believe it 
If you can believe it, then you can turn from your sin and your old way of life, and you can trust it all by faith on Jesus. And the promise is he'll give you life. He'll cause you to be born again. He'll give you abundant life, eternal life that will take you through any setback you might have. How? By believing in the promises of God. If you reject that destiny, then you have a destiny of death. But God gives you the choice through Jesus. You might be here today. Listen to me on Facebook in third service today. You could choose right now. Right now. You have the opportunity to say, man, I know I'm a sinner. I'm on this path away from God. Right now, I'm going to turn by faith, trust in Jesus to give me life. I surrender my life to Jesus. In the act of your will, in the spirit, you pray, and God makes your destiny change. The promise of Jesus, man. Believe in those. He'll take you through. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Jesus, we thank you that through your setback, you accomplished and fulfilled your destiny and provided for us a new destiny. Help us have faith, God, to believe in the promises of Jesus in the midst of our setbacks, that you might take those and make them a step up, Father. We ask you to help us have faith, trust in you, God, that you might be glorified in the way we live. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm gonna...